The Timberwolves select Kevin Garnett from Farragut Academy. A high school kid? No chance. He saw the future of what basketball was about to become. He does whatever it takes to win a basketball game. All I know is all out. I do. I want to be challenged to the end. Anything's possible! DraftKings has brought their expertise to legal sports betting. DraftKings Sportsbook is the best in the game. It's a legitimate sportsbook based right here in the U.S., so you can sleep easy knowing your funds are secure. All new customers can wager $1 on the game of their choosing. And so long as the game doesn't end in a 0-0 tie, they will win $100 in free bets. Make sure you download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and sign up using code SMOKE. Once you do that... Bet just $1 on any Thanksgiving game, and DraftKings Sportsbook will give new customers $100 in free bets once any team scores a point. Check it all out through the DraftKings Sportsbook app. There are player props, live betting, future betting, and much more to mess around with. Jack, we got some interesting matchups this week. Your Cowboys are taking on the Falcons. Let me hear your thoughts on that. Man, it's, just, it's a big game for us. Took a, a big loss last week against Denver, so we have to get this win against the Falcons to get right back on track. Don't miss out on Thanksgiving football with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use the promo code SMOKE when signing up to receive $100 in free bets if you bet $1 on any team to win. That's promo code SMOKE. Head to the app now to check out all the great odds and promotions DraftKings Sportsbook has to offer. Jack, you know, in the past life, I think I was a baker. Why's that? Because I know how to make that dough. Bake that cake, then. Get that bread. Milk that cash cow. Yep, and the place where you can build and grow that money is with Moneyline. I like that. Save up for a new car, your daughter's degree, or that dream vacation you've always wanted. At Moneyline, you can now get up to 5% cash back. Or you can earn up to $500 on everyday purchases. And round up all your spare chains automatically into Bitcoin. It's time to secure the bag and be the banking baker you've always wanted to be. Just go to MoneyLion.com and download the app. The lines of money are coming through. Shout out MoneyLion because these young kids are securing the bag. Welcome back, All The Smoke, Season 3. Zach, what's up, bro? Man, I'm crunk, man. My boy on the show today, man. I just turned up. I'm ready, man. Hey, man, we've been trying to get this dude for a minute. It's just no fingerprints, no evidence. It's hard to track this man down, but he finally let us throw a net around him. Man, both of our teammates, our brothers, great player, but just a better person. Welcome to the show, Jamal Crawford. Hey, y'all was trying to get me. I was trying to get y'all. I've been looking for y'all everywhere. Prime been, time. I've been looking for you. You've Show been time. looking for me. Looking for me. <laughs> Prime no, it's, time it's, is in the building. Man, he is. Yes, He's here. Yes, He's here. With a little bit of facial hair, too. He said he, yeah, can, yeah, let, yeah. he, he can let it grow out now. He, he don't have to fool him no more. Yeah, I ain't got to trick him no more. Ain't no more gimmicks. <laughs> I'm on my part. <laughs> they know what it is now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's OG, triple OG status now. For yeah, real. Yeah. I mean, yeah. motherfucking 20 years in the league, definitely. We had IT back um, at the end of season two, and we actually called you during, he called you during the show. During like I said, this has been highly anticipated to finally get you to sit down with us. Uh, wish we were in person. At some point, we'll get you in person. We're probably going to come fuck with you in the program in the summertime, but... It's just good. It's just good to have you, man. It's good for you to be here. Damn, we, we, I, nah, nah. We, we wouldn't get through a show if he was in person, because you know how he like to tickle niggas and uh, shit. Laugh and like, touch we, yeah, yeah, nah, we, 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 yeah, we would have got through All that positive energy, man. You know, I, got to get <laughs> I got to feel all it. All that positive energy. <laughs> all that positive energy. Nah, I've been, I've been a fan of y'all show, man, from day one. Like for real, for real. I've watched all your episodes. From Ken Griffey Jr. to Steph to Lou Will to IT to everybody to everybody. Fat Joe, I've watched everybody. Like, I've, I've been one of the biggest supporters, and y'all are making it look so good, man. It's, it's, it's so man. big for our, our culture. 
it's almost like you know how drink champs is when they when they pay homage and show love to the ones that's been in the game for a while. It's the it's the basketball version, right? And y'all do the dopest shit. So I'm excited yeah. to be on. Appreciate that, bro. For sure. For sure. First time meeting Stack. Do you remember that? What were your thoughts? The first time meeting him. I remember the first time I saw him that I can remember he was with. He was with this. What year? Hold on. We were the Spurs, Stack. Oh three. Yeah, it was 03. I think that was the first time I really remember. He was just cool as fuck. Hood nigga. As soon as I saw him, I was like, ain't hood. He just reminded me, <laughs> reminded me of, 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 of how we grew up. You know what I mean? Like, so it was just that that natural, like, love for each other. That's the first time I remember really seeing him, seeing him. And then getting the story and obviously playing with him. But that was later on down the line. But I remember he was in Jersey. We went through that crazy lot of stuff. You know what I mean? Just so I've always been a fan of his, just how he moved and, and his game. Like, he had that. He had that OG old man game that you couldn't do nothing with. Almost how Paul Pierce plays and, you know what I mean, guys like that. Every time we played each other, we used to always talk about how we wanted to play on the same team and play together. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. We always, always talked always about did. that every time, We did time, talk about bro. that. Every time we saw it, we talked about that. Oh, we got to play together. We got to play. And it finally happened in Golden State. And he was one of yes, the first sir. people I seen when I got there. And it was an in-between transition. We couldn't be the we believe, you know, Matt, how y'all had it rocking. But Stack, with, Stack and Monte and, and Goose with the linchpins there, so just to come there, that was the first time I, I came and and it was sunny outside when I woke up from practice. I'm like, damn, it's, like, it's seven o'clock and sunny. I've been in the dark. Like this is cool. You know what I mean? So it was just a it was a rough period with that. But I love the bay, even though we don't hey, have a lot of stuff. Hey, showtime. <laughs> you, you smell that? Popcorn's popping. Ooh, you know that popcorn pop. Jack, you know when that popcorn parts out, that the, uh, the blood start going. We could hardly shake out there after that. <laughs> it's time to rock. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that popcorn ain't for everybody. We know that. Mm. We know it's that. Not. Mm. It's not. It's mm. not. <laughs> Let's talk about your upbringing in Renton, Washington, right outside of Seattle. How did you first fall in love with the game, and how was your upbringing? Yeah, I first fell in love with the game because my dad. A lot of people don't know my dad played at the University of Oregon with Kevin Love's dad. So. Okay. I've been around the game since I was two. Like I had a basketball room wherever I went, wherever I went. Everybody in the in the, in the area would tell you, like I'd be the kid dribbling the ball, come down the street. I see somebody and I shake them. They look back like he's crazy. What's he doing? <laughs> For real? For real? They, people going to work, going to the office building. You know what I mean? And I would take the ball with me to the mall. I take it to the movie theater. If if I was going to sleep, you know what I mean? Like the balls in the bed with me. It was a yeah. carry on I had in the, in the plane and everything. So I just been around the game forever and just always dreamed and dreamed about being in the NBA. So it was, it was a crazy, crazy thing. And people would tell you, I used to be the kid wearing the, the Chicago Bulls breakaways because of Michael Jordan at, at nine, 10 years old. Like I, <laughs> people around the community would tell you, that, oh, Jamal, he always had the ball. And had some candy and he had the ball with him. Who did you idolize? Oh, MJ. It wasn't even close. Like he, yeah. he, was, he was the one that allowed you to dream. And that's why I said about great players. Like, there's great players and some of the greatest players, and they cold, and we all pay homage. But you look at MJ, and he allowed you to dream. It was like you almost saw, you could hear some smooth jazz or some some song playing in your head when you watched him play because he was just something mm-hmm. different. You know what I mean? So I loved him. I loved Magic. Loved loved Isaiah. Iverson, as I got older, Iverson, Kobe, Penny, uh, T-Mac, Grant Hill, Kevin Garnett. It was like my favorites. GP, obviously. So, yeah. Mm. Mock move, another one. Mock move for sure. Everybody like Mock yeah. move. Yeah, yeah, cold. You, you played at Rainer Beach High, produced a number of players such as Doug Christie, Nate Robinson, Kevin Porter, Deontay Murray. Who were your teammates? You got any fun stories around the time when you was playing there? Nate. Nate was my the one I played with. So Doug was 10 years ahead of us, and then Nate was in the same era as me. So I was a senior, he was a freshman. And Nate was the same way he is right now. Like at hey. six in the morning, six in the morning condition, everybody like, man, what are we doing here? Nate's up there laughing, getting everybody in trouble, running around, acting a fool. <laughs> so I remember one game, I remember one game, Nate threw me a lob. And it was, it was a badass lob. There ain't no way I should have caught it. But you know, sometimes you throw the, the bad lobs, that, that create the best dunks. And so he threw the lob. I had to stretch all the way back and I got it. And it's like, I thought I was going to fall forward. I just felt all off balance, but I dunked it. And Nate was laughing like, oh, I set you up, ball. You know, Nate. And I was, <laughs> I was like, damn, I did that. I feel like I did a summer, so I ain't never doing that again. So I just stayed. I kept my game on the ground after that. I was like, Nate, I'm cool. You crazy, dog. <laughs> Nate is a problem, dog. He a fool, man. A fool. Full time. Little, little, little walking muscle. Yes, mm-hmm. he is. Yeah, he don't get hurt. Mm-hmm. He grow a new muscle. 
<laughs> if anybody, I, I tell people all the time, if anybody could have played football, it's Nate motherfucking ass. Yeah. So, so Stack, he was he was basketball player, state player of the year his senior year, football state player of the year, and owned the record for the hurdles and track all in the same year. Like he yeah. really could have did anything he wanted to do. Yeah. No, I say he's one of the greatest athletes ever. Ever, ever, by far. You led the Vikings to capture the 1998 Washington Interscholastic State Championship. What was that moment like for you? I know I won a state championship in high school. Ain't not, there's, there's not a better feeling than winning the state championship with your whole family, led your whole neighborhood. You know what I mean? Saying you was the best in high school. How was that like for you? Yeah, now winning the state championship was the best basketball feeling even to this day. And it's crazy because a lot of people don't know this. I ran away from home when I was living in LA. So I was with my dad from 13 to 16. And I ran away from LA to come back to Seattle. And so my mom and dad were never together. I was either with one or with the other one. And so when I came back at 16, I went to the gym immediately. And everybody was like, damn, Maul's back. But I, I left at 5'9", I came back at 6'4", six, 6'5", six, mm. right? And so I had the same handle and everything. So they like, damn. So when I was going from gym to gym, I was like, where's everybody playing at? Where's the, you know, where's the, where's the hot spot? That was my mixtape. If I was a rapper, those were my mixtapes. I'm building the buzz everywhere I go. This ain't social media, so mm -hmm. building the buzz, building the buzz, building the buzz. Then finally, the buzz built so much, I started playing the Pro-Am, which is Doug Christie's Pro-Am at the time. Boom, it's still my mixtape circuit. Now, you know, I'm going on small tours. I'm doing the House of Blues. I'm doing all that. So, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's crazy. I averaged 30. I averaged 30 with Doug as a 16-year-old. Me and only Doug Gray was the two high school players playing. I'm playing against hey, Damon Stoudemire. Hey, everybody. Doug Wren. Hold on. I want to cut you off. Doug Wren. Talk about him. Finish your story, and then we go back and talk about Doug Ray. But go ahead. All right, for sure. So uh, that's my that's my House of Blues. You know, that's my uh, that's my Family Fun Center. That was my ESPN Zone concert. So I'm doing that. I'm killing. Now the buzz has grew so much. It's high school. So high school, I'm like, man, I don't even see y'all no more. I wasn't playing against Damon Stoudemire and Sean Kim. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So for me, I wasn't trying to average no number. I was trying to win the state championship, and it became such an event. That's when Gary Payton, Sean Kemp, they're coming to my high school games, like coming to watch me. Oh. I think King Griffey Jr. even came to one. Because mm -hmm. um, the state the state tournament was at the Kingdom where they played at. And 60,000 people came over a four-day span. And I was just trying to put on the show every single night. Like I became kind of like a celebrity, not like a shout out Shea Cotton, but you know how Shea Cotton was in LA, like yeah, the name? that buzz. Yeah, that's, that's how I was yeah. in Seattle. Like I, even mm -hmm. with the Sonics and college kids, I was probably top three or four most popular basketball player in the whole state. And so mm. the buzz just took off. And then winning the state championship capped everything. That's dope as fuck. For sure. Talk, talk about Doug Wren. I got a chance to play with He was a motherfucking monster. Talk to me a little bit a about monster. for the people that don't know Doug Wren. Shout out Doug L. Wren. Doug, Doug was so cold. Like, people think I was the first person to put the, the state on, like, nationally. It was Doug. He was the first person to go to AAU and blow up. ABCD, ABCD camp and blow up. And people was like, damn, y'all got players out there. So he kind of helped open the door to AAU basketball mm -hmm. for this area. And then I came the next year and kind of kicked the door open as well. But he put it on the map. And Doug mm -hmm. was such a proud bro, so competitive. He was so good, but he was mean. Like, he was mean, mean as shit. He was an asshole, too. Oh, he was mean as shit in a, in a, in a competitive way. You know what I'm saying? So he, yeah. made me, he made me better. He made me sharp. And I'd known him since I was a kid, but he was dominating. And we yeah. had two different games, but... I think I would like to say we made each other better. And Doug, shout out to Doug. He's the best player I played against when I came back in high school by far. It's not even close. He should have been in the NBA and played how many years he wanted to. Definitely. He was tough, man. He was tough. Yeah, um, he was a problem. Obviously, speaking on Doug, we spoke on Nate. Doug, I mean, Doug Christie. You guys just have a breeding ground for talent out there. Um, what is it? Is it in the water? It's just us all you guys do. Stay out of trouble. Is hoop. Like, you guys have a list of credible, credible, I mean, credible NBA names. Um, what was it like coming up with those guys and then everyone kind of outside of, you know, Doug Wren, you just mentioned it, pretty much making it to the league and playing against each other, but you had played against each other for a long time already. Yeah, to me, it started with Doug Christie. Like, Doug's the one that set the whole play up because when he saw me at 16 and he's like, all right, you can work out with me. So remember, I just came from L.A. where I ran away to being ineligible. I made varsity as a freshman, couldn't play because I didn't have the grades. And then I come back and I have this pro saying, you could make it. Meet me at the gym, you could work out with me. I didn't have Doug's number. I didn't want a dollar from him, like teaching me how to get it myself. So if he told me to be at the gym at seven o'clock and the gym was 45 minutes away, I'd drive a car that with no license plates, so I'd catch the bus, whatever it was, I would beat him to the gym. I'd be out there waiting for him when he pulled up. 
So he's like, damn, this young kid's serious. I'm going to help him. That was the first person I seen have a handheld foam roller, take care of his body, ankle weights on, and drills and shit he's doing. I'm like, man, if he if he can show me the way, like this guy, this professionalism, if he can show me the way, and it changed my life, if I make it, I'm gonna do the next thing for the, the same thing for the next generation. You know what I mean? And that's how it kind of like really snowball, whether it's B Roy or IT or Will or Tone or Zach or Dejounte or Kevin Porter, whoever it is. We all know there's an eighth grader that can call us. He could reach out and text Zach with me, like, yo, I'm having, I'm struggling with this part of my game. And Zach's gonna respond to him. So I know mm-hmm. if Isaiah's doing a backpack giveaway, 15 of us are gonna be there supporting. If I'm doing a pro am yeah. all 20 of them are gonna be there playing. So that's how that's what makes our community special. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not the it's not the crab in the bucket mentality. It's like, nah, you made it, your job is to reach out and get the next one to pull him up. And he and he just keeps going. So that's how it's supposed play. to be, bro. Yeah, that's exactly mm-hmm. how it's supposed to be. Yeah, but that's one of the, pu- the rare places that it actually happens. You know what I mean? Like, there's talent everywhere, but for every right. for whatever reasons, it's just not like it's supposed to be. But it's beautiful to see. I mean, the way you guys really go out and support each other is is still to this day. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Appreciate it. Yeah, that's what and we we know. We got something special too, and we just know we're gonna always be right here for the younger ones coming up. And that's the only thing mm-hmm. we want is we don't want nothing from you. Just keep doing it for the same, the next generation. Yeah. You, you had one of the best crossovers this league's ever seen. Spoke very highly, AI, Tim Hardaway, Isaiah Thomas. Uh, your ball handling magic, where'd that come from? Uh, imagination. Like being in the backyard a lot by myself. Me and my dad used to get into it because he'd be like, because he didn't make it, right? And so he mm-hmm. thought he should have made it. He was all sitting in L.A. And at that time, he went to Dorsey High School. So if you all sitting in L.A. at that time, it was like he was an All-American because the best players was right there in L.A., or, you know, so we thought. So he thought he should have made it. When he didn't, it broke his heart. So when I, I'm coming up now and I'm chasing my dream and doing my thing, he's like, man, you got to have more to life than basketball. And I, I mean, him was kind of at odds a little bit. So I'm like, why are you not supporting my dream? But he's telling me from a grown perspective, like, nah, the chances you make it are pretty slim. So you got to have something else you roll with. As I got older, I understood that. But at the time, I'm like, man, so I'll be in the backyard by myself. I'll be down the street by myself. And I watched AI. I watched Isaiah Thomas, I watched Tim Hardaway, Mahmoud, I watched all them dudes, Baron Davis, right? All them dudes, Steve Francis. And I never stopped taking notes. At that time, everybody was doing the left to right crossover AI was doing. And so I'm like, all right, people are catching on that everybody wants to do the AI crossover. How can I do something different? So I started going behind my back. Like, okay, what's going to be harder for you to get if it's behind my back? Then I started, okay, I'm going to go behind my back twice. Okay, I'll do behind my back twice to a cross. Okay, I'll do behind my back twice to a cross. <laughs> and so now... Now I'm just countering whatever you do. And I feel like I got full control of the ball. Like when I dribble the ball, I'm not thinking anything. I'm like, okay, if I don't know what I'm going to do, there's no way you can know it. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, but, I, but I'm one with the ball. Like when you walk, you're not thinking left foot, right? You're just walking. That's how I feel when I'm dribbling. I can lose the ball, cross, and put it into another cross. Like people see the Wesley Matthews move I did on him. I actually lost the ball at the end. If you go back and watch it, I lost it for a split second. And that's when he thought he could run up. And that's mm-hmm. why I hit him with another move. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, I just became one with the ball. That's all it was. And just imagination. And what's crazy, y'all, my best moves, this is no lie. I promise to God. I'm not even bragging. My best 10 moves I have in my, in my bag, I've never showed nobody. Because I was hoping I made an all-star game. That's for sure. <laughs> tell, me, tell, me, tell, 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 tell them why. Could you what? Prime I was hoping, time. <laughs> I was hoping I made an all-star game. And so I, that's I what you was going to bring them out. I was gonna bring him out. You know how at, back then, if you made an all-star game, Kobe had to wrap around the body the whole time. T Mac threw it off the backboard. Like people have a signature play. I said, I got some. I got 10 plays I ain't never did before. I'm a, I'm a, every time I get the ball, they better not guard me because every time I get the ball, every time down court, I'm bringing out another new play. And that's what I was gonna do. I promise to God, I had it all planned out. That would have been mm-hmm. crazy. Mm-hmm. But but it never mm-hmm. happened, but it never happened. So it's just in the boss now. They just I just play it myself so I could just hear, you know, because they just ain't gonna see be seen by nobody. We want to give a thanks again to our friends at Manscaped, the global leader in the below-the-belt grooming. Gift your extended family and the in-laws a performance package 4.0 and earn some major brownie points. It's the ultimate hack to become the family favorite. Nicks down there are not fun. Good thing Manscaped has the perfect package for your package. Inside, you'll find the Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, weed whacker ears, nose, and hair trimmers, crop preserver, ball deodorant, crop and reviver toner, performance boxer briefs, and a travel bag to hold all your goodies. It's a cornucopia for your ball sack.
The Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. It also gives you the ability to turn your 4000K LED spotlight on and off when needed for a more precise shave. Plus it's waterproof. The Performance Package 4.0 also includes a weed whacker to chop the worst weeds up top in your nose and ears. This nose and ear hair trimmer uses a 9000 RPM motor powered by 360 degree rotary blade dual system to provide proprietary skin safe technology which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. Don't forget Manscaped's liquid formulations, the Crop Preserver, Ball Deodorant, and the Crop Reviver Toner Spray. They're like sweet potato pie and ice cream after Thanksgiving dinner. Can't live without it. Manscaped has been busy and they also just launched their refined body wash 2-in-1 shampoo plus conditioner, both featuring Manscaped signature scent that will help unlock your confidence this year. Get 20% off plus free shipping by going to manscaped.com slash all the smoke. That's 20% off plus free shipping by going to manscaped.com slash all the smoke. Be thankful for this holiday season. For the best gift of all from Manscaped, your balls will thank you. First person you hit with probably uh, with your cross in the league. The first person I hit with the cross in the league. I'm trying to think because I had to be comfortable enough to do it because my rookie year, I didn't feel comfortable at all. Um, I think, you know who I think I hit? Well, I was like, Ooh, that was a good move. I think I hit uh, Tony Dill. It's my rookie year and I hit Tony Dill and he was with Phoenix, Phoenix at the time. It was right before All-Star break. And I hit him with a couple crosses. It was just simple right to left stuff, but it was like, it gave me confidence. Like, oh, okay, you can do this. You can pull it off. So I think mm -hmm. he was the first person I hit with a cross. Yeah. Shout out to Tony mm -hmm. Delt. Tony Delt. Yeah. Uh, you got your, you got in 2001, you got your jersey retired in high school, um, 2018, introduced to the Hall of Fame. When you look back on it, obviously you said winning the state championship was one of your most prized possessions in your basketball career. When you look back on the body of work and then being rewarded and honored the way you have been, What's the first thing that comes to mind? Thankful, because that wasn't the that wasn't the the goal, right? Like it was just I was on a mission. Like I said, I had a mixtape, I had Chitlin Circuit, I got to the big stage, and I just had to just keep going. Like the mission was. I remember when I was a kid. I've never said this. When I was a kid, I used to be like, man, I'll pay the NBA to play in the NBA. Like for me, it was never about the money. It was none of that. For real, I was like, I ain't got nothing but five dollars, but they can have it. I just want to be on the big stage and play with the best players in the world. So it was just like all a dream looking back. You know what I mean? Like it was all a dream. It really was. It still trips me out when people were like, man, you know, I love watching you play or this is that. I'm like, because that wasn't the goal. Like the goal was just to make it. And I would have paid them to play in the NBA. Yeah. Talk about you said everyone's really close knit. Um whether you make it or don't make it, every you guys all support each other. You just hosted your 12th annual backpack. Uh, drive this past summer. Uh, what does it mean to you to be able to give back to your hometown the way you do in so many different facets? That's another part that's crazy because I was already giving back before I actually had anything really to give. Like it was just in my heart to do it. I remember one time I was uh, walking down the street and I had, I think, $20. And there was somebody on the street that was homeless and I gave it to him. I didn't know where my next $20 was coming from. I'm in high school. And I gave it to him and just kept moving. And I remember my sister told me, she was like, you become a bigger version of what you already were once you come into a lot of fame or a lot of money. You know, if you was an asshole, you're going to be even bigger right. asshole now because you got more money to kind of stun on people. If you were somebody who gave, who was a giver, you'll give even more because you have it more in abundance. So for me, it took me a little while to get my foundation in place. But I was already doing that stuff. And what's, and what's dope about it for me, out of every hundred things I do, they only report one of them. And to me, that's like the sign of really giving from your heart. It's not for the other stuff. Sometimes right. you got to do other stuff to inspire people and get them, you know, get them to give as well. But right. I like to give anonymously like that. So it's, it's really, really dope. That's, that's, it makes me happy, honestly. Earned a scholarship to the University of Michigan. Yeah, Michigan. Big Blue. Blue. And committed to play yes, under sir. Coach Brian Ellerby. How was the recruiting process for you? Any other schools that was interested in recruiting you besides Michigan? Yeah, so it was... Uh, it came down to Michigan. When I was a kid, I was like I said, I was in the backyard shooting. If I make this shot, I remember I'm not even eligible at the time, ninth grade. If I make this shot, I'm going to Michigan. If I make this shot, I'm going to be in the NBA. Three, two, one, right? I'm, I'm making those shots at the time, but I'm, it actually worked out like that, which is the craziest shit ever because there's a million kids doing that, and it doesn't work out that way. So I'm just so blessed 
And I always dreamed about going to Michigan after the Fab Five. Like the Fab Five that. was I'm, everything to me. They changed everything from the from the the ball heads, the the, the baggy shorts, the the Barclays on, just the swagger they played with. I'm still not sure you'll see five true freshmen come from high school mm-hmm. and go straight to the NCAA championship. Then do it again, sophomore. So I was mesmerized. And then I went on a visit there. And when I went, I committed early. I was like, damn, I'm going to Michigan. Like, it was everything I thought. And they gave me Jalen Rose's locker, who was my favorite player at the 5-5. Five, five. I'm like, oh, it's over with. So it came down to them. Fresno State with Tark. Tark. Uh, yeah, with Tark. Uh, Washington, of course, and then UCLA. And I remember talking to BD. I've never told this story either. I remember talking to BD. And I was like, bro, you going to leave? Because, you know, he's at the time, he's a sophomore in college. And he ended up leaving. I'm like, damn, if he would have told me he was going to leave, I would have went to UCLA. You know, I've been playing with y'all, and I've never told that story. I've been Ooh. playing with y'all. And <laughs> that would be crazy yeah. to lose, to lose Baron yeah. and get you. Ooh, yeah. we. Well, that would be crazy. Because y'all was wearing the blue Iversons at the time. I remember yep. all that. Yeah, the shiny ones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, that's And funny. Steve, Steve Lab was recruiting me. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So I would have went, went to UCLA if I didn't go to Michigan. Damn, I never knew. That's dope. <laughs> yeah. What other schools was recruiting you? So it was it was Fresno State, Washington, UCLA, and Michigan. And I and like I said, that AAU scene I kind of blew up. So I had I could have went a lot of places that after that. They was like, oh, okay, you're getting letters from Kentucky now, from Kansas, you know what I mean? Different places, Louisville. But I, I really wasn't really considering them. I was gonna either stay on the West Coast or go to Michigan. At, at the start of the 1990 season, <clears throat> he got a six-game suspension from the NCAA. The, the retroactively ruled that this high school living arrangement has breached the bylaws. A whole bunch of bullshit. And big Some words. bullshit. Yeah, a whole a bunch of big bullshit. shit. Were. Yeah, what that was about, bro. So, out here in Seattle, y'all know the tech world. There's a lot of people with money. There is a lot of people with money. And remember, I just told you guys that my grades was messed up coming from, from L.A. to Seattle. So, when I got here, I started meeting people, and I met somebody who helped me with uh, tutoring, Gave me clothes, like money for clothes and everything. He wasn't giving me money like, hey, I want you to go to this college or I want you, I'm an AAU program, none of that. So it wasn't like he was a booster or alumni or AAU program. He had nothing to do with basketball, period. And so the NCAA found that out when I was in college. And they were like, yo, yo, you was doing this in high school? I'm like, yo, yeah, I got, I was very upfront. I'm like, yeah, I got a tutor. I didn't have much. He gave me some clothes. And so with that, they said I broke the rule of amateurism. It wasn't even a rule at the time. So once they, did, <laughs> once they did their due diligence and they saw I was I was cool, they were like, okay, well, we're going to reinstate you, right? But you got to miss a certain amount of games. Because they had banned me from college basketball. I was banned from college basketball because I broke the rule of amateurism in their eyes. And so they did all their due diligence. They reinstated me. And at that time, I put my name in the draft. But crazy story. So we're about to play Michigan State. Our team is doing well. We're 13 and four, I believe. We're about to play Michigan State. ESPN game and Dick Vitale's doing it. Now, you know us coming to college, like Dick Vitale's, like we want him to say you a diaper dandy, any of that, right? And so he's pumping me up before the game. I think Spike leaves at the game. It's a national TV game. I'm ready to go. I'm leading score, leading assists, lead my team in block, leading the steals, like, you know, as a freshman. So they're like, okay, we're about to play Michigan State. And Michigan State was nice. It's the Flintstone. So they won a championship that year. Mo Cleese, Mo Pete, mm-hmm. you know, Charlie Bell, all of them. And they, it's in Michigan. It's packed. We get a chance to, you know, see how we match up. And they tell me two seconds for the game to start. And they're like, oh, it's only going to be one game. That one game turned into the season. I put my name in the draft. And I'm going to tell y'all something crazy. I was not going to leave after my freshman year. I only put my name in the draft because they said, you got to come back early from summer school. I said, summer school? I just left two weeks ago. I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, all right, I got something for y'all. I'm going to put my name in the draft. Now you can't make me come back to summer school because I'm going through this process. And so that's what happened. People thought I was crazy. I go to Chicago camp, tear it up for two days, go to Chicago camp late because I wasn't going. I'm like, oh, I'm not going. And my college coach was there. My assistant coach, Curtis Towns, he's at Kansas, shout at him. He's like, come here, you'll kill it. I come there a day late, still the show in three days, don't play again afterwards, and end up being a lottery pick. And Michigan was history at that point. Damn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that's crazy. Yeah. I was gonna get I was gonna get into how you came back and you had the Crawford crazies and what you oh, did when you came yeah, back, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. If, if, the, if the NIL was in, I would have been making yeah, big dollars that, at the time. That was my question. That was gonna be my question. I mean, with the movements you had, and like I said, this is before yeah. the internet, really. Yeah, you know what I mean? Was. The movement you had, what could you have done with this new NIL rule? 
<laughs> oh, I'd have killed it because I was the uh, because you gotta think Michigan's like it's it's world famous, right? The block mm-hmm. and people forget I was at school with David Terrell, Larry Foot, Tom Brayton. Like I'm at school with those guys, and I'm one of the most popular players on campus. I have my own, like you just alluded to, I have my own student section. So I was, mm-hmm. I think I was the only player in the country besides like their team student section that had his own player section within that. And mm-hmm. at the time, nobody's really wearing headbands. So I'm bored in college. And it took off. So everybody had the Crawford Crazy. That's crazy you knew about that. The Crawford Crazies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, yeah, I, NIL, I probably would have ate up with that one. Mm, mm, mm. They wasn't ready for you, fam. No, nah, fam. I came with that spruce wrinkle. You know, <laughs> just gave us a little taste. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Fred, my, my, big, my big homie, Big Fred, I got to shout him out. He's from Detroit. So he gave me a plan. And like, you guys both know me. I'm very calculated. So I, hey, he had a plan. He said, look. The first game you get on campus, this is where you show the people of Michigan that you can ball. They cut people on Ann Arbor. So I, I killed that game. I think I hit the game one shot. Then we played uh, Detroit. Shout out to Shaw Phillips. He was on there. And they just they just beat you all in the, play, in the tournament the year before. The man. year before, yep. Yeah, so he come back. He was like the college Iverson. I get the game with him, block game with a shot on them. So now I show the college campus. I show the people of Detroit. And my dog, Big Fred, was like, now... You get to show the cable world. Remember, at that time, it was the Big Ten ACC Challenge. So we played Georgia Tech on TV. Jason Terry came to the game. He's in Atlanta. I played well. I was player of the game, I think. And then he's like, all right, now the stage is set for you. So now I play Duke on CBS, and that's when the whole country's watching. Because this is before the internet, so people don't know what's mm-hmm. going on. And I, sh- I stood out. I had 27-6 to six against them. Mm-hmm. And Coach, Coach K came to me after the game. was like, man, you had so many moves. You started doing his head. He's like... He did his head like the guy, and he got game. He got so many moves. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so it was uh, it was dope, man. But Big Fred gave me the blueprint on how to kind of take over college. Man, shout out Big Fred. That was a blue. Yeah, that was a beautiful out blueprint. Fred. Yeah, it was. He played it out for me. Drafted by the Cavs with the eighth pick, but was traded to the Bulls with Chris Mim. I remember Chris Mim. Remember draftees: yeah. Kenya Martin, Mike Miller, D. Miles, Chris Richardson. That was my rookie year as well. Remember. That was my rookie yep. year as well. That I got drafted. I got not graduated in 96, got drafted in 97, but went, went overseas and bounced around some injuries and stuff, but came back and ended up having the same rookie year. But talk about that being drafted and going, uh, by the Cavs and going to the Bulls. But hold on, Jack. It just came back to me. Didn't we play each other in Utah Summer League? You was playing with the Grizzlies? Y- yes, bro. That was the first time we met, man. I don't know why it just came back to me. Matter of fact, we yeah. scrimmaged in the back gym, and Jack was killing. That's when I first met Jack. Yeah, that yeah. was the first official Christmas. time I met him. Yeah, but um, yeah, I was crazy because you know how the speculation and being the draft thing. I didn't, I never thought I'd be in the draft room. I was in there with Courtney Alexander, shout out Courtney, and I was just on a visit to Fresno State the year before, and he was the man. So to think a year mm-hmm. later we're man. the same, to think a year later we're in the same like draft room. I'm like, damn, I'm in here. I felt kind of out of place. I'm the youngest one in here. You know, all these dudes established. A.J. Guyton, Khalid el you know what I mean? Like, Mateen Cleaves, these dudes are, have done work in college. I played a half a year. You know what I mean? So I'm just there listening, really. And they was like, this, you're going to go here, you're going to go here. I'm like, we'll see how it plays out. Nobody had me going top 10, though, because, you know, I'm late on the scene. So when I go top 10, the day of the draft is in Minnesota. I'm wearing a Chicago Bulls. I got a Chicago Bulls shirt on, Chicago Bulls shorts, um, a bandana because I thought I was baby A.I., I had my Chris Ayers chain on, the Chris Ayers bracelet, and it just it just came that way. When I got drafted by Cleveland, I didn't think it was going to happen because I had never worked out for Cleveland. You know what I mean? So I'm like, why are they drafting me? I didn't, I didn't know how the trades work and the, all that. I just saw the cameras come around, and boom, the Cleveland Cavaliers select Jamal Crawford. I say with every, you know, hi to my family and all that, and get to David Stern, and then start going to do interviews. And after that, within 15 minutes, it says, you've been traded to the Bulls. And I was like, oh, like, so they were going to take me number seven regardless, but the Cavs didn't know what the Bulls were going to do. So they were like, hey, take take Jamal for us and we'll give you money. And you take men. Or take men for us. We'll take whoever you want and give you money. So the Bulls were like, that's a win-win for us. So that's how I went down. Mm. Shout, out, shout out Jerry Krause for that. Yeah. Hey, Courtney Alexander, though. If y'all don't know about Courtney Alexander, if you nice. want to know who Courtney Alexander is, go to your L.A. Fitness and the guy that's on the wall, that's dunking <laughs> on the wall, that's Courtney Alexander. That's, that's really him. Hey, y'all didn't, y'all didn't know that? Hey, I didn't know that, Jack. That's crazy. And, 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 and LA Fitness, they got a guy on the wall that's dunking. That is Courtney Alexander. No, I seen it. Ball head and everything. I mean, <laughs> yeah. LA Fitness all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's him. <laughs> hey, hey, he gets up, he used to get up four feet on his jump shot. 
Mid range, yeah. he was crazy. He was he was cold blooded. Yep. I think, I, I think you touched on something that's pretty dope now. That's so odd. Like you're the norm now. Like kids leaving early is the norm. Not even yeah. going to college, but you were in a draft, and you mentioned all four year All American players. Like that's how mm-hmm. the league was. Like these young players really wasn't coming in. Like you kind of you you had a similar situation that Kyrie did. You guys both played maybe a handful of games and then bounced. You know what I mean? And See, that was that was back then when you did it. It wasn't happening. Me and Kyrie actually, so up until Kyrie, I was the, I was the player that played the fewest amount of games to be drafted as high as I was. Kyrie played even less than I did and was drafted higher. So you're right. When we were coming to the league, we were like one of two or one of three young guys. And we had all vets. Like we, we mm-hmm. learned how to be pros by with pros around right. us. You know what I mean? So that's what the league is missing now, though. Like they don't uh, they don't value the vets like they should whatsoever. Not at all. Yeah. Who was your vets? Who was your vets your rookie year, Chicago? So my rookie year, we were the youngest team in the league. And in the second year, we were the youngest team again in the league. So the next year, it was like uh, Fred Hoiberg, Rick Brunson, Greg Anthony, Charles Oakley. Um, mm-hmm. Oh, You know, those were like Ron Mercer. Shout out Ron Mercer. Those were like the mm-hmm. vets. Those were the vets. And then Scotty Pipp- Pippen, I played with him his last year in the league in, in my last year in Chicago. But I learned how to, you know, stop eating McDonald's. Being on time yeah. as a young player. Being on time as young players, getting there an hour early, you know, right. staying late. You got to be last one to leave, dressing a certain way. Like, that's when I learned to be a pro. Yeah. Bro, you was, I used to, you was there. I, I used to be on the bus on the way to a game, arguing with some people back home on the phone with the bus going, you know, that's not the way you do things. You know what I mean? But I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know no better. Yeah. I didn't need no better. Yeah, I didn't know no better. Yeah. Tell me about the dynamic of having Ron and Elton Brown on the same team with you. Oh, man, I got some story. Let me tell you a story. Oh, my God. (laughs) Let me tell you a story, Ron. And you know, both y'all know. So we're playing, and Ron sometimes could, you know, Ron could get on one. Yeah. And he can't, he can't, but he always liked me. He always took to me. No matter what he was doing, he talked to me. (laughs) So he came to practice that day, and he said, Ma, I'm on one today. He said, they brought in somebody, a new player. I'm on one today. Watch this. It was a 10-day guy that had nothing to do with Ron. He wasn't a threat to Ron. No, none of that. <laughs> none of that. He said, I'm on one today, bro. He said, I'm on one today. I said, all right. I said, well, what you going to do? You'll see. You're on one. So he would start, ah! He would scream, ah! He run around and scream, ah! Four times, blocking people, fouling people hard. He said, ah! Tim Floyd, got, <laughs> Tim Floyd got in his face. I've never told the story. Tim Floyd got in his face and said, what's all this? He said, ah! Ah! Oh, him too. I said, <laughs> Ron was out of control, bro. Like, but I, I loved him. Shout out Ron Ortiz. He put me on, he put me on Panera Bread too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> random as fuck. Yeah, he put me on Panera Bread. Hey, talk about talk about Elton Brand, because before he tore his Achilles, Elton Brand was one of the best power forwards in the game, hands down. Without a doubt. Without, hands he, down. Uh he was he was a walk in 20 and 10. Mm-hmm. Like they, they showed me like his rookie of the year campaign and they had a brand of soap. It was like a soap box and they had brand on it. 20 and 10 on it. The one you can depend on. Like he was mm. a walking 20 and 10. <laughs> <laughs> he was the one you can depend on. Right. Yeah. So he was, yeah, he was 20 and 10 no matter what. He just knew how to get it. Like he was a, a beast. Workaholic always works. Always uh, was improving. And he was smart. He was very cerebral as well with his talent. So he was, mm-hmm. it was a problem. But people would never know about Elton Brand like they should in this era, you know? Right. Shout out Elton yeah. Brand, man. Shout Definitely out Elton Brand. He's over there, over there working uh, in the front office with the Sixers right now. But that motherfucker was a killer, bro. Oh, he was it's, a killer. It, it, it's, it's still hard to believe that him, Ron, and L.O. was playing together in high school at, at church, at the church, mm-hmm. St. John's Cross. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. And, at the church. and Eric Barkley, who I think was on their age. Eric, Eric, Eric Barkley was on their And Reggie Jesse, yeah. all those guys. Yeah, they was cold. animals, bro. They had, yeah. they had a squad. Okay, what, what was your welcome to the NBA moment? Your rookie year in Chicago, you, you, we just talked about your vets. When you get in the league, what, was your, what made you feel like you had got to the NBA? Like the welcome to that first moment you, that you had? Oh. There's a couple moments. The first one was the first preseason game we're playing in New York and Latrell Sprewell. You know, at the time at the Garden, you can see the, the other team at the other end of the, of the tunnel. So at the time, you know, the Bulls come out and Sprewell and just came, went to the finals. They're over there on the other end. And I hear Sprewell say, OK, I'm reloading. I'm like, what? Like, damn, I can feel it. Like, I'm nervous already. I'm a rookie. Here goes Spree. And that was like the first, first moment. And another moment was uh, 
my rookie first game, I'm playing Sacramento. I'm a lottery pick. We're terrible. So what's the formula, right? If you're terrible, you're a lottery pick, you probably going to play a lot. They want you to develop. I didn't play to the last minute of the game. My whole family's there. I flew them all in. I played the very last minute of the game. Got two shots up, though. Made the first one. <laughs> and that, <laughs> got two shots yeah, up, though. Got two shots up, though. Made the first one. And that was like my, my welcome to I'm like, damn, this is really a business. Mm. Like, they just took me. That was my first moment. Like, when they took me as a, as a, as a high draft pick, I think I'm going to play. It's a blowout. And he puts me in, like, to mess with me because we had got into it. He puts me in the last minute of the game. Made my first shot, though. My dad was pissed, too, by the way. But, yeah, that was my <laughs> it was, Hey, he, he had the OG stance. We kept pulling up his pants like, shit, let me go tell them. Because this is crazy. You know, he had one of those going. But it was he was upset. I remember that. Yeah, that's funny as hell. Yeah. So you're coming into a Bulls organization that just had one of the most dynamic six, eight-year runs we'd ever seen. What was the organization like? Kind of, you know, you said you played with Pip your first year. or No, you played with Pip before he yeah. left. What was it like kind of ending that era and coming into this new, younger era of the Bulls? It was amazing because the the front office, Jerry Krause, had a lot of confidence. He was like, I drafted you, I drafted Fies, you drafted Guy, you drafted LME. Okay, that's the young part of the game. Now, he truly believed that we were going to sign Grant Hill, Tim Duncan, and Tracy McGrady. Like he said, we all this cap money. He believed we were going to sign all three of them. And so at the time, I'm, you know, I'm just new to the league, so I'm not understanding, like, oh, okay, we're going to get those guys on the team too. All right. But he really believed that. So the front office had a lot of confidence from that eight-year run. They feel like they can make some stuff happen. Um, the fans, it was always sold out. It was always sold out because I think them tickets were in advance. They thought, you know, mm -hmm. they weren't going to break up. So they was already sold out. So we were terrible. But we played in front of a great crowd every single game. So it was, it was, it was tough in the city walking around knowing that, they just had all this success and this dynasty. And we come in as this young group who's trash right now, trying to figure it out. You know what I mean? But so I really integrated myself in the city, going to the hood to play, uh, going to all the hood spots just so they could see me because I was one of the new like faces. So I wanted to make sure the city, you know, was connected somehow to our team. So that was good and bad, by the way. But yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was good and bad, by the way. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're rolling around with the shot. In the Chicago hoods, I don't know how much good could really come from it outside of getting bro, some good game in. Bro, I went to the, this place called the Ickies. It's the projects for real. Like, to the point when the Bulls found out I was there, they was like, you could have died over there. Don't you ever go back over there. <laughs> for real. For, I swear to God, the front office, they was on me, so I never went back. But I was there. I saw That's where I saw a young Will buying. I saw Tony Allen. They was there, too. You know what I mean? I was like, there's some hoop stuff. But the hood loved it. They're like, right, man, don't nobody from the Bulls hey, come over hey, here and right play. Up. Right so up. They got play you, they got, in the projects. They got you going to the hood, and they got Ron working at Best Buy. Y'all all over the place. Oh, we was all over the place. <laughs> we, was, we was running and saying, we was all over the place. <laughs> well, for real. But we, and it's crazy, because me and Ron was the one who jammed together. Like, that's my boy. But, um, like, now nah, I was in the, like, it's it's one thing to be in the hood. I was in the projects for real. Like, there's people in Chicago that don't go to the, to the icky, so. Unless you're from yeah. here, you know what I mean? Yes, yeah, so I was all over the city. Young fam, making moves. Uh, you guys draft Jason Williams, the Duke point guard. Uh, he yeah. ends up getting in a pretty much a career-ending motorcycle accident. Did you get to see any of his brilliance uh, before he got hurt? Yeah, what's crazy about that is, so, Jay Will, um, when I blew up in high school, certain rankings had me kind of high. So I ended up making second team parade All-American. But Jay Will was on first team. And we actually played one all-star game together, the EA Sports game. It was in the Bay. I think it was mm -hmm. the first one. DeMar Johnson, Jay Will, Boozer, Dunleavy, myself, we all, Casey Sanders, we all played the game. And so I was hip to Jay Will. We knew who each other was. And so he came in for a workout, for his Bulls workout. And we actually played against each other afterwards. Like, we was going at it. And they kind of saw that. And so I'm like, are they really going to draft him? Like, I just showed them, like, you know, you, you got a point guard here. Because at the time... It wasn't like you played two point guards. It was like you played one or you played the other. It wasn't like it yeah. is now, positionless basketball, right? So I'm like, I just showed them. I remember being in the draft. I never told this story. Well, I, I remember being in the draft room at the at the. I know we were in a room at the at the practice facility, and we drafted Jay Will, and I stormed out, and it crowds everybody. Like, Ooh, he left. He left like, and I was pissed because I knew what that meant, like. Jay Will was the Reggie Bush of, of college basketball. Like, he was only right. the first crack at it, right? And here I am coming off an ACL injury. 
play, working out with Jordan and coming out and, and filling my game, going to a new level, but I'm hurt. So now I'm, I'm back healthy, but it's my third year now. I'm not the I'm not the new toy no more. You know what I mean? Even though I hadn't played a lot. And so I knew what that meant. And when they drafted him, I, it was like we went at it because it was either one or the other. Mm-hmm. And finally, at the end of the season, they played us together and we both flourished, right? So to see him uh, have that success at the end of the season and myself, and we both was like, all right, next year they're going to play us together. We're good. And that day, I don't know if Jay Rose ever told the story, but that day we were all in the Chicago facility working out, myself, Jay Will, and Jalen Rose. And we saw him. I remember Jalen Rose like, hey, be careful on that bike, man. Like, you know, later on that day we heard about the accident. Mm. And it was crazy. It was crazy. Yeah, it was. It was crazy to hear that because he was just about to take off. He was. Yeah. Oh, he was. Yeah, he was nice. Did he not know the rules though? No, he knew it. Yeah, I think I think he knew it, but you know, he knew. Just, he may not know to the extent, you know what I mean, but I think he had an idea. You know, nah, they kinda, I ain't gonna. I, I ain't gonna lie, bro. I know when I first came in the league, and you know, you when you be around the best, you peep it. Wasn't nobody yeah. fucking around on no motorcycles. Wasn't no. nobody doing no uh, X Games type shit. Wasn't nobody, <laughs> wasn't none of the old schools and the vets doing none of that. So we automatically knew this is out of bounds. Motorcycles, all that shit, ain't nobody doing that, bro. That's out of bounds. Yeah, he, and when we heard, bro, like, oh, it was crazy because it wasn't social media. Like, it had to get confirmation right. from doctors to the team yeah. to, you know what I mean? Like, it was different. Yeah. And it was just sad, bro, because his his career was really about to take off. He was yeah, people caught. don't know. Like, people know him as an NBA analyst. Like, people no. don't know how cold Jay Will was, boy. Shit. And, in, and in an era like this, oh, he would be Oh, he would kill. Blood. He, he would kill. Strong, shoot, jump, everything. Well, you don't, you don't get criticized now for being a scoring point guard. Like, that's value. Yeah. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, it's, it was different. Then it was like, oh, you got to be this. And we were running the triangle at the time. Me uh, and Jay Will like, damn. We can't get jiggy with this shit. How are we going to win a triangle? <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, we ball handlers. Like, we want to go. So we, we we start getting, we start figuring it out, though. So when did you feel like you really, you said, you know, you're coming off this injury. You guys have a little success at the end of your season. You're coming into your fourth season. That's when you dropped your first 50 ball versus the Raptors. Is that fourth season when you really kind of felt like, okay, I'm trying to get this? That Well, the end of the third season, when they start playing myself and Jay Wells, like, I got it now. I got the speed of the game. I got, and we were playing teams like the Nets when they were fighting for something. We were playing teams fighting for some vets. We played Milwaukee when they had GPS and we said we beat them. So we started figuring, I'm like, okay, my confidence is growing. I think I averaged 19 and seven in the last 20 games. I'm like, I'm going to next year running. It solidified when I thought I learned playing back in my second year working out with Jordan, but because I got hurt. But that's when I took off. The end of that third year, I was like, I got it now. And that's when the fourth year I took off running for sure. Mm. 04 traded to the Knicks for Jerome uh, along with Jerome Williams in exchange for Matumbo and others. Uh, when did you find out the news? And is that when you kind of first realized, like, okay, here goes the business part? Yeah, well, it was crazy because damn y'all got me telling a lot of stories I ain't never told, but this is what this is for. So it was crazy because Isaiah Thomas was the first person to call me at 1201, you know, when I was a free agent. And he said, We want you, you know, we feel like you fit in perfect with us. Um we want you here. You're our top priority. They called me at 9 p.m. West Coast time, 12 p.m. on the East Coast. And I was like, damn, the Knicks. I locked in on the Knicks. And that was in July. I didn't sign till August 7th. So it's a month and some change where I'm hitting my agent every single day, like, what's going on? What's going on? He's like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And I remember talking to the Chicago Bulls. They said, we'll approve this trade for $56 million, right? And so that was the other moment of truth in business because I'm like, okay, I can take this guaranteed 56 million from, from the Knicks right now. The Bulls will let me go. They'll help me get here. Or I can play off the fact that the Bulls say they don't want this other player. I can say they don't really want me back anyway. They're going to take this player and I get seven. Right. And so I could have played it that way, but I'm like, you know what? I ain't never signed a big contract. At that point, it's just ego anyway. Let me sign, secure my future, and just keep moving. That's what I did. But I could have easily got more if I would have stayed true. Like, nah, I know y'all gonna take them. I know y'all don't want me back. You just drafted Ben Gordon. You don't want me back anyway. You're gonna take this deal. But it helped give them more cap space. You know what I mean? So that was another business play. Mm, mm, mm. So yeah. you're joining the young Knicks team who was rebuilding. What's that like? I mean, you you went go, go from one historical franchise to arguably the biggest franchise at the time in the game. What was it like being a Nick? Oh, it was incredible. It was incredible because I I historically don't play preseasons hard. Like I kind of ease into it. That that I, I, that, I historically don't play. Yeah, I historically don't do that. Oh, but, that's crazy. But 
Once I went to New York, and the first game, I'll never forget, Fat Joe was sitting there. <laughs> Dane Dash was sitting there. You had showtime. all kind of people sitting there in preseason. I'm like, oh, I got to put on a show. So it was showtime right from the start. And I set the tone. And then, you know, everything's bigger in New York, right? Everybody mm-hmm. gets excited off anything. So I said, I'm going to set the tone from day one. So when the season comes, I'm already rolling. They already know what to expect. And Allen Houston started off that, that season injured, so I started. And I just started. And Steph and I, people don't know this, but Steph and I was the second leading scoring backcourt in the whole league, only behind Gilbert and Larry Hughes that first year I was there. So I loved mm-hmm. it. It was, it was like I was, I was on stage performing. I remember Samuel Jackson, like I said, came to a game. And he said in the cross, I wasn't playing a particular game. I had something on my hand. And I was like, he was like, you're not playing? I'm like, no. Nice. Oh, like, I only came to watch you play. Mm. I'm like, damn. Like, That's damn, crazy. this is crazy. Like, and that, then having a good game and going to Tao Restaurant and seeing Adam Sandler. And I know he was just at the game, so he's showing me love. Like, so I was on stage performing. You know what I mean? And, and that's why the guard, I came to bring it every single night, no matter what. I mean, we're, we'll talk more basketball, but you also started doing some off the court stuff too. That's what did, did you do? You did something with Jay Z, right? What'd you do with Jay Z? The S dot. Yes, the S dot. So that went back going to my last year of of Chicago. Okay. Yeah, it, it's crazy because I had played for Jay at the Rucker. He called me. He was like, "Yo, I need you at the Rucker." So I'm like, "Cool, can I bring Eddie Curry?" He's like, "Yeah." So I went to the Rucker and we tore it up. And so that relationship really took off. And then he was like, uh, "No." So and then. Fast forward or rewind to Chicago. Myself and Jalen Rose's locker is, is side by side. And we're both with Reebok at the time. And they will always send us the same gear. You get a pair, you get a pair. And one time, the s Dark Carters arrived. I looked over at Jalen's locker. I didn't see none. So I'm like, man, what's going on here? So then I hit my, <laughs> for real, I hit my, I hit my Reebok rep like, yo, what's up? They said, Jay wants you to wear a shoe. They want you. I'm like, for real? They're like, yeah, but it's not technically a basketball shoe. It's just a high top version of his low top. They was like, if you like it, you can wear it. I'm like, yeah, there's like, you'd be the only one in the league wearing it. I'm like, I'm wearing it. They're like, no, nah, I mean, you can't get hurt. You got to make sure. I'm like, it's cool. I'm good. So it's like wearing some Air Force Ones, basically. And I we play, we play Philly, and AI was first. Like, man, you can wear those in the game. Like everybody had the low top. They sold out. They was going crazy. And I'm like, yeah, I could wear them. And I played well, and I kept wearing them. And that relationship really grew. And then I went to New York. We got even tighter. Oh, I got a story for y'all. Jay-Z, I remember we went to eat after a game. And he was playing Rick Ross. I don't even think Rick Ross knows this because I've never sold it. But Rick Ross, he's playing, um, what was Rick Ross? Every Damn Hustle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Jay was mesmerized by that song. He's like, you hear that? Like, whip it, whip it real hard. He kept saying that part. He loved it. And that was my introduction to Rick Ross, this new Jay-Z. And Ross has never heard that story. So if I ever, if he sees this, he's going to know, yeah, that Jay was the first person to put me on there. Larry Brown uh, put you your second year there and the six-man role. Initially, how did you take that? You became arguably the greatest six-man in the history of basketball. But at at the time, where was your mental with that? Yeah, I didn't see it at first because I was starting. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I was starting the year. I, I've always started my whole life, so I had never come off the bench. And when he tried it that year, I had some success, and he said I improved more than any players he ever coached. Was was huge coming from a legend like that, but I just, it was weird to me. I just felt inferior at the time. Like, man, so I'm not good enough. You know, I work programmed to think, like, damn, the starters are the best players. You know what I mean? So, it, it was different for me, but I had some really big games, and I saw his vision. I just didn't understand at the time, because I'm only 28, 29. Man, I may have been 26 at the time, and I had a lot of success. And he trusted me. Like, I had the ball late and everything. He's like, it's not about who starts, it's who finishes. Mm, He always said that. He always drilled that in my head, always drilled it. And so I learned a lot from Coach Brown. He's actually probably the best teacher I've ever played for. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, yeah, like, he was was incredible. And he had that that foresight and that vision because I didn't see it for myself long term. So go I and came finish, into go and finish the game, son. Who the, that's what he's always yeah. telling me in Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah. Go and finish the game, son. Son, so. it can. We have to get rid of the characters. <laughs> we have to get rid of the characters here. You can have a big bucket of ice cream, and a bird flies by, and just a little piece of bird shit flies in ice cream. The whole ice cream's ruined. He would say stuff like that. Like he was, he was a teacher, bro. <laughs> like for real. No, no doubt. I remember I came and played. So I was kind of bouncing around my first few years, and I came to your guys' training camp late. Remember, I came to training camp. Late as a motherfucker. They didn't. Oh my God. Go ahead. Yeah, this is when Zeke Zeke had just taken over, if I'm not mistaken. Or no. Yeah. He was there already, but yeah. But it was yeah, yes. it was some shit where they invited me to training camp late. I come in, I play well. 
they won't let me fly back to New York because I don't have a suit. A suit I'm just on, like, yo, yeah. y'all didn't tell me I needed a suit. I had to have a suit to get on the plane. So everyone's giving me one of each. Someone's giving me pants. Someone's giving me socks. Someone's giving me a belt, shirt, jacket, tie, the whole nine. So I go on this team and there's a lot of injuries. So I go from like the last dude in training camp to starting like the first eight to 10 games. And then I remember uh, Isaiah comes to me. He's like, you know, we got a lot of, we got a lot of money on the bench to start, you know, the guys are starting to get healthy. I'm thinking, okay, well, shit, I'm just about to go to the bench and I'm not going to start anymore. These niggas cut me, bro. I played yeah. like eight, 10 games, started, played well, and just got cut. And got cut. It was crazy, Matt, because you really could not get on the plane leaving. We were like, well, he didn't know he needed a suit. So we all <laughs> make sure, for real, that's a real story. Yeah. So Jack, he could not get on the plane. He just went through training camp with New Hill. He could not get on a plane to get back with us if he doesn't have a suit on. So everybody makes sure the suit to make it happen. Man, I remember we was out one night. It was me and you. And it's a moment. It was us two out, and we were out of the lounge or whatever. And this dude was coming to say what's up to us. He danced from about 30 feet. He did a sidestep dance all the way until he got, he got toward us. And me and Matty said a word to each other, but we both started cracking up. Like, we knew what each other was thinking. He... He did a sidestep and finally said, what's up, man? What's up, y'all? He did a whole, <laughs> hey, hey, Prime, he did a whole Deion Sanders celebration to get to us to say what's up with these belts. I swear to God, me and Matt hey, was cracking up. Absolutely. And, I, <laughs> hey, the reason why I think I got cut, though, is because, as Jamal mentioned earlier, he known Nate his whole life. Nate was a fucking terror, and he was always oh pranking people. So me and him got yeah. into, like, a pranking war. And this nigga put uh, uh, it, uh, uh, the the itching powder in my tights, and everybody knew with me. Remember, I went to practice, yep. and my motherfucking crotch was on fire, bro. Yep, yep. <laughs> Nate did a lot of. Hey, Nate stopped at the whole shower when Malik wanted to kill him. Nate did so much shit, bro. It oh was yeah, crazy. <laughs> and the thing, about Nate thin is, the thing about Nate is, you can go back and forth with him, but he just got too much stamina for that shit, so he gonna yeah. keep going. He'll never like he's stop. gonna keep. He'll never, never stop, stop, so you ain't gonna win. You're like, man, fuck it at this point. Like, this is too much. This nigga he pranked me in, he pranked me in Target one time. He ran into me in Target and, like, threw some shit at me, and I couldn't see who it was. I was ready to fight. It's like, this nigga just never stopped. Nah. He, so you he had a never good stops. 04 to 08, good run in New York. What was the one thing you remember about that fan base? It was incredible. I And this is a lot. I never got booed there in four and a half years. And that's saying a lot, because we weren't very good at the time, and they just knew I played all out. Like, I... I wasn't scared to take the big shots. I hit game winners. I missed big shots. Like, but I wasn't scared. It was like I was one of them. Like people from there, like, yo, you from New York, right? Like, no, I'm from Seattle. But they just took me as one of their own. So I just remember the fan base was incredible. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yeah. When the time ran out of New York, you came to go to stay with your boy, man, in the trade for Al. Yeah, you was really ideal, Phil, because we need we needed somebody to come in and bring some more scoring. Um, tell me your first thoughts on coming to Golden State, coming to us and Don Nelson, the great Donnie. The great Donnie. So I was, <laughs> I was, <laughs> I was shocked to be honest with you, because at the time when I got traded, myself and Zebo got traded the same day. And so I went to the Warriors, he went to the Clippers. I was, we both were averaging 20. We were, I think, six and four in the first 10 games. And so we were like, damn, we're about to make the all-star game. We in New York, they're gonna juice us up. You know what I mean? So I was shocked. So after I got traded, it took me a couple of days. I remember I met you guys on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And it's and, and Jack, honestly, once you embraced me, the rest of the team did. So you made that transition easy. It's like when you a new kid going to school, like to a new school, and you know you know the best you know the best player there. So if he embraced you, everybody embraced you, and you made it way oh, easier. And I remember Jack was like, "That go back to what we you. talked about, though. We was trying to play together, so." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was like, "Thank you. I finally got some help. I finally got some help." I, but Jack was. <laughs> Jack was, he was unbelievable, just like his work ethic. I remember we was in New Orleans, Jack, and you was the last one on the court after shooting. I'm like, Jack, we got to come back here in a few hours, dog. Like, you're tripping. But just like your work ethic, your leadership. I remember we went to eat with Bobby Brown in Utah, and you was like, man, stop playing safe. You got to shoot the ball. I'm like, no, I got to make sure everybody got the ball. He's like, no, you got to shoot the ball, man. So just that embracement from you, it trickled down to everybody else. You know what I mean? Monte was coming back at the time. Don Nelson was out there outside practice playing with his dogs while he had Keith uh, run, pra <laughs> run practice, <Lucky. laughs> run practice, playing with his dog. But it was just a, it was just a dope environment. I wish we could have been good. Like if I was at the time, y'all was we believe, and I came, Ooh. it'd have been even crazy, even crazier. But yeah, yeah it was it was dope. It was dope to finally play together, even though it's short lived. We 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 get together. 
we in Boston. And Ooh, uh, and then we was in our Showtime and Primetime mode then. Yeah, Showtime Prime, you know, yeah. Showtime and Prime, you know what I'm saying? We we always get our talks for the game, but crucial play in the game. You cross Ray Allen over, make him fall, throw it to me in the in the corner for the three. You remember that play? Come on, man. Hey. <laughs> hey. What was crazy about it was the, he fell, but... But then he laid, put his hands out like he was Jesus for real. Like he just laid down for a second. <laughs> he laid down for a second. I'm like, hold up, man, that's Jesus. Jesus ain't doing that. But Rondo, <laughs> that's crazy. Rondo, Rondo, Rondo came over and it, it, it passed it. Like I was always taught, no matter how the play goes, you got to finish it. You know what I'm saying? Like whether it be a pass or a shot or whatever it might be. So when I did it, he kind of half came and I threw it to you. I'm like, Jack, make it. That's just laugh. Like Jack, and then Jack started talking, like, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, Jack is quiet, dog. Like, for real. I, I, I was telling Matt last night. Jack is doing whatever you want to do. I was telling Matt last night after I hit, I ran, I ran down and I bumped Ray. I was ready for the yeah. smoke, then I wanted all smoke hey. after that. What's crazy about y'all two, though, for real, for real, out of all the teammates I ever had, like, if I was going to war, like, I got to have you two there. There's no doubt about it. I know you're going to ask me the five later on, but I'm just throwing that out there right now. Like, y'all two is sick. <laughs> <laughs> I already know the format. I, I'm a, I'm like, a it's not gonna watch the show too much, dog. <laughs> <laughs> During a victory over the Bobcats in uh, December 2008, you had a 50 point game. Thus, becoming the fourth player in NBA history, only after mm. Wilt, Bernard King, and mm. Moses Malone to mm. score 50 points with three teams, bro. Mm. That's why. And that's why I call you Showtime because you show up. How did that mm. feel? And being in, in the conversation and the names of those guys, how did that feel to you? It felt unbelievable because, Jack, you was hurt, so you didn't play that game. But I remember we was in Atlanta the night before. It was a back-to-back. -back. I'll never forget it. And I played terrible. And my son was in the crowd because he was living there at the time. And I think I was like 3 for 15. And I played awful. And I remember the next day, uh, Don Nelson was like, yo, we're not having no shoot around, sleep in, everybody, meet the bus. I mean, you know, we'll meet early. So we did that. I remember sleeping all day. I got up for breakfast, went back. I slept all day. And I was just ready. And I started out the game. I remember I had seven in the first quarter. I think I had like 23 going to the half. I just got in the rhythm. And with me, y'all know how I play. I play crazy as shit. So if I make a couple, I feel like I'm hot. You know what I mean? And I, them couple went. And I just kept going, kept going, kept going. I had 35 with five minutes to go. And then Roni started giving me the ball. And Coach started drawing the plays. And I kind of you know, start getting fouled and things of that nature. But whenever you score 50 like that, it's never just you. Like, it's got to be the perfect storm. Somebody set the screen, give you the ball, draw the plays. Like, so when you have success like that, it's everybody. And you can feel everybody kind of take in that. And, and it's dope because, you know, it's something everybody can kind of share in. So, yeah, I was just happy. And when they told me the company, I was like, damn. And then I go to Orlando. We go to Orlando next game. And I got straight, I get hurt in, in the warm-ups when we're in the back before we go. I'm like, because I was trying to get 50 again. I got I got hurt doing the Anthony Morrow stretch when you kick your leg up and, the, and my groin wasn't ready for that. It was weak. <laughs> it was weak. So I had 18 Orlando game, but it was I was hurt. I had to take some time off after that one. I was hurt. <laughs> I was, I was hurt. hurt. I was hurt. Oh shit! You did that. That young Anthony Morrow had to put you out. Yeah, huh? yeah. Cut that, I was, cut that. Hey. I was I was good when he did the sideways swing. I was with him. <laughs> then he started he, he started going front. I started front with him, and it was all bad. It was. It was tough. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Pop goes the weasel. It was all bad. <laughs> it was over with. It was, it was over with. <sighs> it was the Hawks in 2009 to 2011. Backing up all-star guard Joe Johnson and Mike Bibby. You averaged 18 points, two and a half rebounds, two assists off the bench. What was it like coming to ATL and your first action as teammates with those guys? Yeah, it was crazy because that was the first time I knew I'd be a sixth man. And y'all know the league puts you in a box. And so I got to a point where I was like, man, I'm being known as a good player on bad teams. You know what I mean? I didn't want that. Y'all had already went to the playoffs. I had never went. So I, I was just labeled as such. So I'm like, all right, I, I'll do whatever I got to do. And they had just went to the playoffs with with, with Joe and Marvin and, and Al and Mike and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and Josh, right? So they had their crew. I'm like, I come off the bench. I think I can bring something different. So going into that summer, when we play pickup, I would always make sure I would start a game or two later just so I could start seeing the game a little differently. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I'm starting to get used to seeing, okay, I'm not going to be out there when the thing starts. So what you going to pay attention to? What are you watching? And so that first game of the real game, I had three points. I took only two shots. And Joe Johnson, you know, he don't talk a lot. He was like, man, you got to shoot more, man. We need you mm -hmm. to shoot. 
right? And then he told Mike Woodson, Mike Woodson pulled me in his office. He's like, yo, you got to go lead the league and score off the bench. You got the same green light you've had your career. I'm like, oh, okay, for real. Okay, I'm going. So once that hit, we never looked back. And it was crazy because Atlanta, I love living there because that was the first time you saw people like us doing jobs like drug mm-hmm. testing or, you know what I mean? Like anything, right. anything you wouldn't ever see us in. Like, so I was really, really happy. And the people really took to me. Like I, like I said, I, I brought some of that, 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 that old Georgia peach, that lemonade, and, and, and brought the, 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 the flavor to it, what they already had. And it's just a great mix, you know? And then mm-hmm. Orlando, Orlando kicked our ass in the playoffs, but, you know, yes, we, still fun. yes. Hey, but we, don't worry, we got Jack right before you. We swept Jack, destroyed them, came through, stomped all the peaches in Atlanta. Yeah. Sorry. Hey, Y'all beat us by an average of 25 points that yeah, series, man. That yeah, they, 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 beat us by, us. they beat us by an average of 35 points. <laughs> yeah, they, they, <laughs> hey, they was killing us. They yeah, was we had killing a squad, us, bro. bro. We should have won a championship that year, man. Stan got scared in the uh, Eastern Conference Finals and Boston beat us. But no, we had we had a good-ass team that year. Y'all had a squad. But then we came back and beat them the next year, though. Yeah, but hold on. Yep. Before we get to that, though, this is so you win your first six man of the award, uh, six man of the year award in two thousand ten. Yeah. What's that feeling like being recognized as you know the best player uh, coming off the bench? It, it gave me an identity, and it's crazy because mm. like I didn't like I remember Bibby saying you're gonna win six man of the year at the end. I'm like what? And Dominique Wilkins was saying it. I didn't even think like going into the season that would be the award or the goal. But once you start getting closer, I'm like damn, I want it. You know what I mean? I want to do it. So then after that, I'm like, oh, wow. So now it's dope. Fast forward a little bit when I see kids in the gym and they like, man, you made me want to be a six man. Like in our community, it wasn't, it wasn't cool. It wasn't cool to be a six man. Like now they're like, no, nah, I want to come off the bench and I can still kill and be one of the more important players even though I'm coming off the bench. I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. So I didn't know that it would take on a life of its own and have that kind of legacy behind it, you know? So it was big for me because I was going on a, a winning team and I showed like, you know what? I ain't got to be the star of the movie. I could be a co-star and still star in my role. Mm-hmm. And it gave me a whole different identity. Mm-hmm. So 2012, uh, Los Angeles Clippers. Yeah. Uh, thinking back on that Lob City run that we had, what, what, what stands out to you the most? The best team I ever played on that didn't win it. Like, mm-hmm. we, to me, we had everything you needed. It was... Man, it was incredible. Like, if you, it was almost like we were playing 2K with how good our team was. Like, it was just incredible. We just could not get over the hump. And as time went on, it got even harder to get over the hump because now jokes ain't as funny anymore. You know what I mean? Like, you start getting tired of each other and just like, man, the doubt starts creeping in. Other people start creeping in, whether it be family, whatever it might be. And it's just got, it got crazy. But to me, that was the best team I was ever on. We should have went to, I'm not saying we should have won a championship because you needed some luck. We should have at least been to one finals. There's no for question. Sure. What yeah. do you think? You mentioned the hump, and you know JJ and I have talked about it on 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 his podcast and ours. What do you think that hump was for us? For us, I think we didn't handle adversity. Mm. I don't think we mentally tough enough in the moments that it mattered the most. And it could have been me at times. It could have been somebody else at times, or whatever it was. I just think collectively as a group, and you know, you guys know, in winning championships, the group has to all be tight. And I think, you know, we're older now looking, but I think looking back, if we had some of them OGs, like, yo, this is y'all's moment. There ain't going to be another moment like this. Like, you got to get this right now to make it happen. Like, this is it. I think if we had that, things would have ended differently. The likes of, you know, Doc Rivers. We started with Vinny. Doc came in. He was supposed to be that missing coaching piece. Um, Along with Doc, you know, JJ, who just uh, just retired. DeAndre, who's with the Lakers. CPs in Phoenix. Blake's with... The Nets, I mean, we had Lamar Odom at one point, Eric Bledsoe, Darren Collison. Uh, we had a really, really, really talented team. Talk to that. We had everything. And, and it's crazy because we literally won so many games. I think in that four-year stretch, we were like top four or five in the league in wins. Like, we won mm-hmm. so many games. It was just when it mattered most, things yeah. would fall apart, right? Or it would be... Injuries. Some Sterling, Sterling shit or some yep. injuries. Yep. I remember losing Blake and CP in a five-minute stint in Portland. Right. Right. You know what I mean? So, like, it's, it's just, man, I don't know if it was karma or what, but when some when it mattered most, we just fell apart or something happened. The so, Sterling curse. So you're able to win uh, six man of the year, 2014 and 16. I want to say I remember 14. Uh, they wanted you to dress up so you had, like, 
pulled your shirt out of like a, uh, it was freshly folded. You know how they're all compact. And this nigga didn't even want to iron it. He just wanted to take it out and put it on. <laughs> I'm, I'm a hooper, <laughs> man. I'm just a hooper, accept- dog. Yeah, he I'm didn't like to dress up. Hey, so two times, you end up winning it two times to put you three. Uh, I want to say that your boy Lou is tied with you now, if I'm not mistaken, right? For what he's won it three times as well. Yeah, he has. Yep. Shout out to what, Will for sure. Yeah, I mean, what does that mean to you, though, to be kind of the the standard for uh, six man basketball? You said kids aspire to, to 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 be like that now, but what does that mean to you now that you kind of sit back and and now that you're done and you take a look at it? It, it means everything because, like I said, that wasn't the goal either. So it was like to see kids say it's okay to come off the bench. I'm not less than because I'm coming off the bench. I can still be just as important as one starting. And that's, and that's around the country. Like, I've been all over the country, and they say the same thing. Like, man, right. I, I, I want to be a sixth man now. I wanna, I'm like, wow, it's crazy, because I, I was never even thinking that. I was just trying to show yeah. I could be a good player on a bad team. So that's right. crazy. And then to win it at 34, you know, you guys know, once you start getting up there in age, they start saying, oh, he's too old to do this. So they put you in another box. So I, I became the oldest to win it at 34, and then I broke my own record and won it at 36, too, which is crazy, because mm-hmm. that wasn't even the goal in that year. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So it's just a blessing, man. Like I, it's just, and you can't see them there, but they're up there right now, and that's something they can never change and take away. We had some memorable battles in the playoffs with the Spurs. The year they won the champ, the following yeah. year they won the championship. We knocked them out in the first round. Uh, we were the last team to beat the Warriors in the seven game Sterling season before they started winning championships. Uh, but b- uh, battles with the Grizzlies. Uh, what playoff uh, series uh, stands out to you had the most? I would say the Spurs. Were. Because that one was, they had just won a championship. And I don't know if you remember this, Matt. We were eating the night before the regular season, or the same night the regular season ended. And there was like a million different ways of, if this happens and that happens, you guys are yeah. playing this team. If that happens, you're playing this team. And the Spurs, I remember clearly Zebo towards the end of the season, I was like, who y'all got in the playoffs? He's like, man, I don't know. We're trying to stay away from the Spurs, man. And they ended the season like 25 and twenty five and four or something. They were rolling after winning the championship and we got in the first round like damn I didn't even want him in the first round like man if we see him in the Western Finals we'll be ready for him but and we saw him in the first round to me that was the toughest team that I ever played against in, in the playoffs because they were so they were so like detailed and you could have a shot for Bellinelli after him not taking a shot the whole game Pop runs a play for him out of timeout when you just start to relax you know what I mean he make you pay for it you know what I mean? And so they were always playing chess. And Tim Duncan was just unbelievable. Kawhi was coming to his own at that time. Mm-hmm. It was actually maybe Monarch's last year, possibly, yep. if I'm not mistaken, or his last yeah. playoffs. So I think so, the, following, yeah. the following year he might have, I think he fought, retired. But they were saying, the like, following? when we beat them, that was like the end of their dynasty. You know what I mean? Yeah. That team, yep. that was kind of the end of their run. And that really showed us. At the time, you know, it's like, shit, we just beat the defending champions. Like, we, you know, we had the, what it takes to win this. But we just, again, we never just, we, we we can never get over that. And, and, and Matt, and Matt, after we beat them, we go up 3-1 on Houston. So we're like, damn, we're about to be in the Western Finals against the team we just put out a year or two before. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So we like, we're about to win this thing. Yeah. No, it was yeah. it was it was all too good to be true. You know, so you when, when it's all when it's all said and done, um, you got 20 years in this game. Um, are you at peace with that? I mean, you're a motherfucker that's gonna play until you're 60. I already know that, but are you at peace? With three six man of the year uh, awards, twenty years under your belt, and just the legacy you left, I'm at peace with it. But I still feel kind of robbed, to be honest with you. Facts. Like I know for a fact, these last couple of years I could have played and helped yes. the team okay. in whatever role. If they were playing ten minutes a game, if they were playing five minutes a game, if they're playing, you're not going to play, but we may save you for the playoff. Whatever it might be, I know I could have helped, and that part kills me. And then you look at. Somebody like the Marcus Aldridge, shout out to him. He just reached 20,000 points. And I remember when we went out to eat a couple years back, or a few years back, and, and we were talking about that, both of us getting 20,000 points. And I'm like, I'm less than 600 away. I'm like 500 and some change. I'm like, damn, if I would play any one of these seasons, they said I, I, I didn't play, I could have easily mm-hmm. had that. Easily. And that easily, right? And mm-hmm. I already like to, I have the, the most points to never be an all star, but I think that's like legacy to be a guy that predominantly came off the bench in his career and get 20,000 points and yeah. to be this close to it and not get it because of, you know, forces politics. bigger than myself. It's crazy. Right. Yeah, it's, call it what it is, politics. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So I'm at peace overall, but I still feel a little rock. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you touched on it early. I mean, you remember when we first came in the league, whether the vets were playing or the vets were just there to make the place better, there was vets, you know, and now your vets are 31, 32 years old. Like they don't have the older players that I think are missing from this game, not from a standpoint of just so much production, although they can still produce, but just helping these young kids along. They don't have that no more. The, 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 the average age of the league is so much younger now than it was when we came in the league. And that, if, 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 like you said, if, if it was still what it was, you would have definitely reached 20,000 points and, and got to play more seasons. But for some reason, they just don't have room for vets no more. And it's crazy because how could you not want to learn from vets, right? If I'm if I'm a photographer, a young photographer in the game trying to shoot the NBA, and I can learn from Andy Bernstein, like why would I not do that? If I'm a right. if I'm an athlete crossing over to this side, why would I not come talk to you guys first and tell me how things work, how it goes? Like that's what vets are for. Like, and especially when you have vets that want to give back to the next generation, they want to help somebody right. go from point A to point B, right? Like you have these guys willing to do that. There's no reason that Isaiah Thomas and Boogie Cousins and Langston Galloway and Kyle Corver, these guys are not in the league. It's just no reason for it. And it's it's sad because, you know, like I said, you don't know what you don't know as a young player, right? So if you can learn from these guys and take me out of it, if you can learn from these guys and they're in all ears, they've seen these guys growing up, how could you not take advantage of that? And it's just, it's unbelievable to me. And I think it's wrong. It's just wrong. Yeah. So you also on your way out, you know, set some milestones, drop 51 as a 39 year old. Uh, off the bench. Which, off the bench, off which the bench. had never been done. And Damn. then one of only 29 players in the history of the game to play into their 40s. You know, when you hear little little pieces like that, what does it mean to you? Well, that, that uh, backstory about that last game, uh, I needed 25. And the reason why is they showed me a, a graphic, and Kareem, Kobe, and myself were the only three to play in their 19th year and try to get 25 in three straight games. So I had 25 in, in Dallas going into the fourth quarter. I remember before the game, Nico Harrison was there. GP was there. All the greats were there because it was Dirk's last home game. And I told GP, and, the, and you can ask if you guys see him, I told him in the layup line, I'm like, I'm going to put on a show tonight. And I didn't even know it was going to be 50. I didn't think it was possible to score 50 off the bench. I just didn't think there was enough time in the game. Uh, but I got 25 in the fourth quarter, and I'm like, I'm really just about to go now. And then I had 38 with eight minutes to go, and that's when it was like, this is a 50-point night. And that, that's when it just, like, took off and went. And for Dirk to mention me in his speech, uh, for my teammates to look for me, for Coach to draw plays, and you just get lost in the game. Like, you really feel like you're out there by yourself. Like, you just shoot. And I just got lost in the game. I, my feet could be off balance and my shoulders could be a different way. You just need space at that point. And you feel like it's going in, and that's what happened. And I thank God for it because, like, Cole, rest in peace, Cole playing his last game. So that's 60. He was going to get his numbers. He was going for it. I didn't know that was going to be my last. I didn't know that was going to be my last game. You know what I mean? Like I was just going just to to hoop and in, in, in the season on, on, on the right way. So yeah, that was that was crazy. And if that's the last official game I played, then what better way to go out? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, had a pit stop in in uh, with the Nets uh, due to injury, wasn't able to perform. So that fifty hey, ball. Hey, due due to the weight room, Matt. You know I don't lift weights. And, and Jack, uh, they, they, I don't they, lift they tried weights. they tried to put you in there. Fam, listen, so I I come out, I've been home for 16 months, right? I don't want to be the guy who's like, oh, I'm, I'm not doing that or this. But everybody's lifting weights. It's their routine. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to lift. And but that's not your I game, though, fam. Fam, that's not your soon, game, though, fam. But fam, as soon as I got in that wave and I felt it, I said, oh, family. <laughs> this is why I don't lift, fam. It's the best defense I've ever seen with this damn weight room. And, and I came up short. Oh, that was it. Oh, <laughs> shit, shit, hey, but fam, but fam, I had five points and three assists in five minutes against the team. Mm. I was rolling. I, mm. I was cool, but that, that yeah. way wasn't mm. it, fam. I'll stay yeah, out that way room. You developed, you touched on it earlier, but uh, kind of get a break it down, the, the relationship you built with MJ playing pickup games and, and um, you know, just the kind of relationship you had with him when he was coming back to the Wizards as well. Yeah, so my dad, when I was going through the draft process, my dad was telling me, like, MJ likes your game. I'm like, man, dad, how do you know that? Like, this ain't social media. This ain't this era. How you don't know Michael Jordan, right? So <laughs> fast, fast forward, I get drafted by Chicago, and Tim Grover hit me one day. It was like, yo, MJ says you can meet him. And I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, he says you can meet him. So I, I shoot down there, 6.30 in the morning. I shoot down. We had a game that day, actually. And I get to hoops, and it's myself. MJ and Tim Grover in the gym. And I'm trying not to talk because he's doing his workout. So when he talks to me, obviously I speak back. 
But I'll never forget, he was 40 years old. He's about to come back, and he's doing defensive slide drills. And so he's talking. He's like, yeah, when the season's over, you could, you know, in the summer, you could work out with me. I'm like, all right, cool. I get, I leave there I at 7 in the morning, and I call everybody back home, right? In the West Coast, it's only 5 in the morning, so nobody picks up. But I'm telling AJ Guy, I'm like, yo, I just met Michael Jordan. And so fast forward, my dad tells me later on, he said the reason I knew was because obviously he went to Oregon. Remember I told you guys that? Mm-hmm. Amal Rashad, Amal Rashad went to Oregon with him. And Amal Rashad and Jordan like this. So Amal Rashad mm-hmm. was the yeah. one that was telling him that, yeah, it was telling him that MJ liked my game when he was an executive for the Wizards. But mm-hmm. we got tight, bro. Like it, my confidence, that's what set the foundation for my whole career. Cause my confidence went crazy once I was around him and playing with him. And him giving me confidence, like, yo, you got it. And this wasn't just a young player or a vet telling me, even just an all-star telling me I'm nice. This was the greatest player ever saying, oh, I got it. So it was a whole different confidence. So uh, best memory or battle against Kobe and any off-court stories you have with him? Oh, man. So many. The first one that I really remember that Kobe acknowledged me was when we played in the garden on a Sunday afternoon. And he, at the time, became the youngest player to get 20,000 points. I was playing like shit the first half. I think I had two points and I scored 31 the second half. And he came out and he gave me a five and said something to me after the game. He's like, well, you hot as a pistol, but he, that was his first time acknowledging me on the court. Like Kobe had never talked to me. So I'm like, damn, he knows who I am, like for real. And then another memory, when I went to Atlanta, we played the Lakers and we beat them at home. And he across the hall, I remember Monica was back there. Shannon Brown was back there. I think they were together at the time. And he was like, man, can't nobody go all that shit? And, you know, I didn't really talk to him since that interaction two years earlier. So I'm looking around like, who's he talking to? And he's like, he's like, man, he talked to me. He's like, man, can't nobody go all that handle? Like, he's like, man, you got the ball on a string. And he showed me love. I'm like, whoa, did y'all hear Kobe talking to me? Like, you guys know Kobe got this aura about him. Like, it's totally different, right? So that was the next time. And then, um, we were at Richard Sherman's softball game and, you know, we talked more that day than, than ever before. And I remember he told me stories about like Michael Jackson calling his house when he was a great mentor for him. And Vanessa picking up like somebody saying Michael Jackson on the phone, like Kobe told me out of his own mouth. You know what I mean? So different stories like that. Then I asked him when he come to my pro in, I finally got the courage and asked him he's like, yeah. And somebody from Nike, I'm not going to say his name. Like, no, we got to go back to LA. He's like, no, nah, Jamal's playing. I'm going to come. And so he brought his girls, he brought his whole family that came and watched me play. And that was my yeah. highest scoring game and game winner, but it was all because of him. And we just started communicating all the time after that. And, and our relationship really took off. So rest in peace. Yeah, rest in peace, Cole, the great one. You're looking back now. We talked earlier um, about coaching your son. Where is your mind at right now? Would, would, would an NBA coaching job interest you coaching your son obviously it's something you do now what around basketball obviously we know you're going to continue to have your summer league and give back to the community but what in basketball interests you right now what you've been doing coaching like i've gotten offers for nba coaching jobs i've gotten offers for nba executive jobs from multiple teams but i keep telling them i'd rather coach my son like this mm-hmm. is a whole different thing right man. i love it bro it's, it's unbelievable to me like i i write out practice plans at nighttime like I'll send them to you guys every single day on what we're going to work on. Like, I'm, I'm yeah. so invested in this and I'm so into it. I was cool being the parent, just keeping the score. Mm-hmm. And, and, and right. But then when you get into it and, and it's, it's different now, when I watch games, I'm not watching on who's nice and who got game. I'm watching on the play, how they got to that spot. Mm-hmm. I'm like, damn, I'm like, I'm really a coach now. Like, you know what I mean? I didn't see this for myself. So that's what makes it so cool. And just being I used around to the tell game. You. I used to see you, you when you, you were still it. playing. And I'm like, bro, you're gonna want to coach. Watch it, and because I, I people don't understand, man. I as busy as I am, bro, and I'm so busy. I always make time to coach my kids, and it's just a different kind of joy. I feel like, but I remember seeing you would come to watch your son play, but you were still playing. I'm like, watch, you gonna be coaching? Nah, that ain't for me, fan. That ain't for me. You said it. You said Going it, up. man. You absolutely yeah. said it, and it's different because it's it's your own, like watching it, right? right. So like having him. And little William Conroy Jr., like as a as a, my nephew, like coaching mm-hmm. those guys and all these other kids I watched for three or four years on the same team, like bro, my whole schedule is based around my practices in the Straight team. Up. I feel. And I swear to God, like everything is based around that. Yep. So I'm, I'm all the way into it. I agree. It. Yeah. Same position. Yeah, same position. Yeah. Um, it had a big uh, scoring game. I want to say your uh, one of your last uh, summer league games. Uh-huh. Looks like looks like he's healthy. Obviously, you're a big brother mentor to him. You know where he's at in the process mentally and 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 his ability to possibly still play at this level? 
Yeah, he can definitely play at this level and help. I'm looking at the games. I'm seeing some of the guys on the bench. I won't say no names, but I'm seeing different people. And it's like they're just out there just filling time. It's not that like they're really making an impact. And I know he can make an impact, you know, and I know he's in a good place mentally. I'm sure he's a little frustrated seeing the same things I'm seeing naturally. You know what I mean? Like we, we both see that he could be out there helping. And I still think it's going to happen for him. I really do. Yeah. But it's just, it's messed up he's in this position. But this is absolutely the healthiest he's been since he's been hurt. It's not just hype. It's not just talk. Yeah. He's proved it everywhere he's played. And the people that see him see that as well. Absolutely, man. We definitely wish the best for him. Quick hitters. First thing to come to mind. Quick Let hitters. us know your thoughts. If you can watch any sporting event in the history, which one would it be and why? Michael Jordan hitting his last shot with the Bulls because that was just so iconic and it was the perfect ending. And he had people forget he scored with 43 seconds left and he came down, got a steal and had to score again with the game winner. Yeah. Like, and I think they scored like 85. He had 45 of the points. So they scored 83 at 45 of the points with Pip hurt. So I think that's the, it was the perfect ending. It was, if he had walked off the end, it'd been the most perfect ending ever. So I think that's the one event I'll be at. With you off the bench, pick a starting five, with your past teammates in their prime. Ooh, in their primes. Oh, my gosh. You played with some motherfuckers, too. Man. So you talking like Grant Hill, Penny Hardaway? Prime, like I yeah. Prime. prime. You, got, you got five teammates that you played in their prime. No you got injuries. Chris. No injuries. You got to. I'm a, You know what? I'm going to do it this way. It's going to be easier for me. I'm going to do ones that were all ahead of me, so like older than me. I'm not going to do the D-Rose or the CPs or any of those guys. So I'm going to go with, I'm gonna go with uh, Scotty Pippen, a small forward. I'm going with Penny at the point, Grand Hill, mm. those three. Um, that's offense and defense with those three. That's guys. everything. Yeah, that's everything. And then places now. Trying to go everybody older than me, so I don't have to really put the pressure on the four and five. <laughs> um, Charles Oakley at the four, mm. and at the center, or if I get another forward, you could go with. I'm, I'm gonna switch it up. I'm going Steph, Penny, Grant, Pippen, and Oakley. Mm. Nice. I'm just going everybody nice. older than me. Yeah, I'm going everybody older. Than me. Yeah, nice. That's a nice vibe. And that's that and that's Stefan Marbury. Yeah, yeah, Stephon Marbury. I didn't play with Stephon. Yeah, sir. Stephon Marbury. Yes. Yep. And and of course you could say CP, Blake, all those guys, but I'm no, just going you, with you people. Got a list. You got a yeah, young I, Rose too on your list. That's why I, I, I didn't go nobody young. I went all yeah. 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 Uh top three sports movies in your opinion. Above the rim. Mm-hmm. I gotta go with pop. Um He got game, remember the Titans. He got game. I just felt like it was my life, like in high school, how I started blowing up and stuff. So I, I could really relate to, to Ray and Jesus. So, yeah. yeah. I don't think they're three best. There's three that come to mind. Yeah, that's solid. Top five, if you had to pick five dinner guests. <laughs> we. I'm going Andre 3000. I'm going my mom. I'm going... Pac. Mm-hmm. I'm going tomorrow. Dre. Pac. Jay-Z. And Obama. Mm, nice ta- that's a nice table. One yeah. album, one album you can listen to on repeat. No skips. Life, Life after death. Ooh. That was easy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I got the worst head on, so I can do that. Yeah. Do that yeah. That's classic. All right, this is the last question. You should know what it is since you watched the show. If you can have one yep. guess on all the smoke, who would it be? But and, I better, no and I better know your answer. <laughs> yep, you better know him. Uh, Mahmoud. Ooh. Hey, you know what? I, 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 I want to I, get him I, and Craig Hodges. I, and I, I talked to him both. I talked to Craig Hodges when I was doing a speaking engagement in Chicago. We had a, I got his yeah. line, and I, and I talked to Mark Mood in the big three about coming on the show, man. So we definitely mm-hmm. need to get both of them. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely need. But you also if got. I, if I had a slash, I would say D-Rose. 
D Rose. Hey, we need to help with D. So we uh, my my ask was gonna be for you is we need to help with D Rose and B Roy. We know Man, we might he, have to come out to Seattle to get B Roy, but you figure you gotta come, come out Seattle there for the pro am. Yeah, you gotta come Seattle and get B. But I would say yeah. just to come in, I would say Mahmoud and D Rose. Oh, good call. Love you. Yeah. All right, Jamal, man, we appreciate you. But, man, this was everything. And, again, we're definitely going to try to make it out to the pro and possibly sit down with you in person and really highlight uh, everything you're doing out there, man. We appreciate you. We I love you. I appreciate y'all, man. We Hell love of a you career, too. Love bro. you, bro. Like appreciate said, you, doggy. Appreciate it, bro. For yeah. sure, for sure. Appreciate great. y'all, man. I mean, Thank great, you. great player, but even better person, man. And that really, to me, that goes a long way, man. So give our best to the family. We appreciate you. Too, you. Now, and, and, and now you can watch your own episode on All the Smoke, bro. Hey, over and over again on repeat. <laughs> <laughs> hey man that's a wrap thank our guest jamal crawford jack good show we can catch this on showtime Love. basketball you youtube and the iheart platform black effects we'll see y'all next week the timberwolves select kevin garnett from farragut academy a high school kid no chance. He saw the future of what basketball was about to become. He does whatever it takes to win a basketball game. All I know is all out. I want to be challenged to the end. Anything possible!